Well, welcome everyone. My name is Wilma Hodges. I'm the Director of Training and E-Learning Initiatives um, and the Chair of the uh, Sakai Virtual Conference Committee. So I'll be moderating today's keynote presentation, Reimagining Educational Content for a Digital World. And um, just a few little housekeeping details. Um, all the attendees are muted for this session. So if you do have a question, you can enter them in the question box. However, since we have a question and answer session scheduled for later today at 4.30 with Michael Feldstein, um, if you want to save some of those questions for the Q&A, uh, we can answer those later in the day um, once you've kind of had a chance to, um, to think about them a little more if you come up with something between now and then. Um, if there's uh, some folks who won't be with us because of time zone issues and you want to ask a question, that's certainly fine. Um, but we're going to only have a short window for Q&A at the end of um, the, the keynote presentation because we'll be doing more of that later in the day. The presentation is being recorded and it will be available immediately after today's session. So um, if, for example, you missed the beginning or you want to watch it again, um, it'll be available as a link on the conference page, the detail page for the keynote. So you can look for that recording link later um, right after this session as soon as I'm able to upload that recording file. If you do have any problems with audio or video, please just enter a comment into the question area and we'll try to take care of those behind the scenes. So today I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Michael Feldstein. Michael's a partner at Mindware's, Mindware's Consulting and co-publisher of eLiterate. He's also the co-producer of eLiterate TV. Previously, he's been the Senior Program Manager of MindTap at Cengage Learning and Principal Product Strategy Manager for Academic Enterprise Solutions, formerly Academic Enterprise Initiative, or AEI, at Oracle Corporation. Prior to that, Michael was an Assistant Director at the SUNY Learning Network, where he oversaw blended learning faculty development and was part of a leadership team for the LMS platform migration efforts of this 40 campus program. Before SUNY, he was co-founder and CEO of Mindwares, a company that provides e-learning and knowledge management products and services to Fortune 500 corporations with a special emphasis on software simulations. He's also been the interim CLO of the Otter Group, a senior partner at Christensen Roberts Solutions, a senior instructional designer at Raymond Carson Associates. In previous lives, Michael has been a freelance writer, an English PhD student, a middle school and high school teacher, a tire wrangler at Yokohama Tire Warehouse, and a professional loafer at Schoolies Mountain City Park, or County Park, sorry. Um, Michael's been the member, a member of the Sakai Board of, Foundation Board of Directors, a participant in the IMS, and a member of eLearn Magazine's Editorial Advisory Board. He's a frequent invited speaker on a range of e-learning related topics, having been invited to speak on topics including e-learning usability, the future of the LMS, e-portfolios, and EDU patents for organizations ranging from the e-learning guild to the post-secondary electronic standards council, and has been interviewed as an e-learning expert by a variety of media outlets, including the Chronicle of Higher Education, the Associated Press, and U.S. News and World Report. Michael was a very early participant in open source learning management system projects, having been one of the early participants and the only non-technologist participant at the time of the Open ACS community in early 2000, the community that would eventually spawn GPL licensed dot .learn learning management system. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Wilma. Thank you to the Imperial Foundation and to Longsight uh, for hosting this conference and inviting me. Um, I, I had not realized that, Wilma, that I pointed you toward my long-form bio. I, I suppose it's good now if any of you have any questions about my tire wrangling credentials, you'll know that I have, in fact, experience in that field. Um, I, I have to admit this is my first virtual conference. And odd uh, to be speaking to my computer screen, uh, but I think I've got some strategies to help here. I'm, I want you all um, to imagine that I am incredibly good looking, and in return, I will imagine that you are laughing hysterically at my jokes. Uh, so I think if we just do those two things, this will work out fine. Uh, there's one other change here, as Wilma mentioned. Um, I have 45 minutes for presentation, which for someone as long-winded as me is not a lot of time. I am going to try to leave a little bit of uh, space at the end for some Q&A, but we, we have a, 
a time slot that's going to be entirely Q&A later in the day, and I'm going to do an experiment that I'm, I'm calling flipped Q&A, where uh, throughout the presentation uh, this morning, I'm going to ask questions um, of you, and I want you to think about them, and then in the afternoon, you certainly can ask questions of me, but I'm hoping that you'll come to the Q&A with your own answers to those questions. Um, and uh, if you are thinking to yourself right now, well, gosh, Michael, that means you're asking me to do more work here, uh, then you have uh, successfully grasped the essence of the flipped classroom. So, with those preliminaries out of the way, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about content, um, which is kind of a funny, neglected subject as we deal with bringing our classes online. And, and you know, we certainly are um, still using a lot of content. Um, but it, it, I, it, I think it, I think it, I think it occupies us um, when we're when we're designing our courses. Um, we we sort of, you know, are, are used to this idea of the textbook and the textbook and our, our curricular materials, the content, um, occupy a, a strange space um, in our our planning. On the one hand, it's everything. Well, what are you covering? Well, what is your course about? Well, it's a Here's the content I cover. Right? That's, how, that's how we often answer. Here's the content that the course covers, not what are the students doing, what are the students, you know, what skills are they learning. It's, you know, here's the content. Um, at the same time, you know, we have this very uh, circumscribed notion of, okay, here's the textbook. I know what to do with it. Most of the time in the class, students are going to have it put away. They'll do something with it at home. Same thing with other readings. Uh, you know, we're starting to blur the boundaries now that, that lectures are being videotaped on a more widespread basis. That's making us think a little bit more about, oh, lectures are content too. Uh, it, we really have not shifted our thinking overall a lot about the role of content in our classes. And I would like to submit that we need to start thinking about our content as software. Um, and that will help us really um, uh, bring our content to life in a digital world. So consider, for example, the spreadsheet. There are lots of classes in which you might give a spreadsheet to students or ask students to submit a spreadsheet to you. It doesn't have to be accounting. It could be you know, physics or biology or sociology. Um, and I want to ask you to consider um, what is the locus of value in the spreadsheet? What is the locus of educational value? Um, is it the content? Is it the, the numbers in the spreadsheet, the information contained in the spreadsheet? Is it the formulas, the ability to change those numbers and see different results? Or is it some combination of the two? Um, of course, it depends on, on the individual teacher and, and the, the assignment and what you're trying to accomplish. But in many cases, I think it's actually both, that you can't cleanly separate the content from functionality. Um, and if we think about what, we're, what education is about, we really should never be separating content from functionality. Um, I mean, it, we're really past the era, in, in, the, in the day now where I can pick up my phone and type in a few sentences and look up any fact just about. Um, we're really past the point of trying to cram students' heads with facts. The real question is, what are we trying to teach them to do? And how does content, how does the content that we give them function uh, as a tool for them to do that? Um, software makes it more, that more obvious. It, it makes it harder for us to ignore that that is the function of content in a class. Uh, but I would argue that that should always have been the function of content in a class. And um, now, just simply in virtue of making our content digital, we already add some functionality to it. When you think about Google um, or Bing or Yahoo or whatever your favorite search engine happens to be, you know, whenever you put a, 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 a web page up on the public internet, 
you are automatically giving it functionality simply in virtue of the fact that Google exists. And um, you are you're changing the uses to which that content can be put simply in virtue of the fact that Google exists. If you think about how you use Google, right? usually you're not just Googling randomly. There's something you're trying to do when you enter search term. Maybe you're trying to research a car that you want to buy. Maybe you're trying to research a medication that you've been prescribed or a condition that you have. Um, for me, most of the time when I, I search for something, I'm trying to settle an argument with my wife. Um, there are all kinds of reasons that you go uh, to your search engine, but, but generally you go there for a reason. And by making our content available through the search engine, we make it a tool to solve the problem that the person entering the terms into the, into the search box is trying to solve. Likewise, you know, if you think about any of the sites that you use on a, on a regular basis, I'm, I'm today in Washington, D.C. at another event, and I, I've been, in virtue of my job, uh, become close personal friends with Hipmunk, which I use to find flights to wherever I'm traveling. In the days before Hipmunk, the information in it was just a series of tables. You know, you could you know, maybe look up on a static web page or, you know, find at an airport or get printed or have the travel agent look at in their book. Um, I, I really don't know how it was done before the web. I don't remember. But I'm sure that there were documents uh, that contained the same, same information. But we've turned this content into a tool to accomplish specific goals. So what, here's my first question. This is our where we get to the flipped uh, Q&A. What, what I'd like to ask you to think about is um, what do you want your students to do in class? And how can your content, you design your content to help them do it? Um, just take a minute and think about your content now. Is it, is, are these questions that you can answer about your content? And are there, is there way, are there ways you can design your content so that you'll have better answers to those questions. We can get a little more specific about this content as software. Let's think about content as data for a minute. Now, this is a kind of a, an odd concept to wrap your head around, so I'm going to use an analogy to maps. We've been using maps for you know, literally millennia. This map is probably about um, seven, eight hundred years old, I believe. I uh, forget now off the top of my head when it was created, but you can see uh, Rome is probably a little bigger today than, the, than what you see here in the picture. Um, you know, we, but maps remain relevant today. Oh, I mean, literally, the maps give us the lay of the land. They, they help us figure out where we're going, where we can go, and how we get there, um, which uh, is a pretty good analogy. Uh, to what we're trying to do with educational content. And in fact, we use that analogy explicitly. Sometimes we talk about a curriculum map, for example. Um, some of these maps can be quite schematic, like this map of the New York City subway system. Um, some of them can map things that are invisible to us on a day-to-day -day basis. So when, you, when I look at the ocean as a, as a landlubber, um, I, I see a lot of water. Uh, but if I were a sailor trying to cross the ocean, I would be thinking about the currents below the surface and the wind above the surface. And I would need a map of those in order to figure out how to get from where I am to where I want to be. So, so maps um, help us get to the essence of what we wanted as tools, even though they're also content. And they've always been this way, but there's really been a, a major revolution in maps last decade or so. Now um, we can ask the map, well, how do I get from point A to point B? And the map will figure that out for us. It will. Um, and this is, this is important because there are lots of different ways that we could buy a map. You know, one way would be just to scan it, 
up and slap it on the screen and we would you know a digital map but it wouldn't do anything for us that the paper map can't already do in fact it would be missing some things that you can do on a paper map fairly easily um, but what we've done with maps that it's been the real revolution is that we've turned that content into data um, correlated spots on the map with GPS coordinates and that allows us to do all kinds of amazing ask the map to tell us how to get from point A to point B but also to, to begin correlating other things like um, what we know about deforestation. You know, show me the concentration of reports of deforestation in a geographical area. Or show me the impact of a, uh, of a hurricane. Um, or, you know, most when I pull out, when I used to pull out a, a street map, I don't so often anymore, I, I didn't really want to see, I just want where I was going and how to get there. And what I really wanted uh, was to have uh, somebody sitting next to me who will say, all right, at the next corner, I don't have to think about three steps ahead. I, I just get guided on where I go. And if I make a wrong turn, oh, you made a wrong turn, just go ahead uh, to the jug handle and, and reach a turn. And maps can do that for us now because we've turned that map content into data. And maps can also do all kinds of things, not only help us find where we wanted to go, but also to help us find places that we didn't know we wanted to go. So this is one of my at the moment. It's called Chef's Feed. And uh, what it does is when I get into a city, I can look up um, of, of dishes at restaurants that are written by chefs who are cooking in that city. So I can find where the local ex food professionals go to eat when have a really good meal. Um, and I, you know, I didn't know that I was looking but boy, that place three blocks down sounds great. Um, and this is possible because we've turned our content, our map content, into data. So I'd like to ask you another question here to consider that we can talk about uh, later this afternoon, and that is, is there an educational equivalent to GPS coordinates in your content? Is there some organizing principle that can be divided up into discrete chunks and can be correlated with or mapped to other information to make it more useful? Now, there are a couple of answers. I'm going to give you a couple of easy answers. One is time. Um, you know, a syllabus, in part, is a, it's a schedule. It's an organization of our content by the days and weeks in the semester. And if we turn that into data, if we make it readable by a calendar app, well, I don't have to tell you how useful it is to be able to open your calendar, see that such and such is due the day after tomorrow, Oh, and I also have three other things that are that are going on to, to tomorrow, and that's going to impact my ability to get my homework done. Um, but another thing that we hear more and more about in terms of GPS coordinates is competencies. I don't want to get too hung up on the particular term. You can call them learning objectives or learning goals or competencies, whatever, however you want to term it. But the basic idea is that you're going to take your content and break it up into little chunks of concepts or goals or, or bits of learning that you want your students to get. And uh, depending on the content, this is easier or harder in different disciplines and, and different topics. Math uh, is probably one of the easiest. You can build a skill tree that says, all right, you know, before you learn um, linear inequalities, you have to learn something about linear equations, right? But once you learn linear inequalities, then you can learn these three other skills. Um, and so what you're looking at here is a competency map from Khan Academy. Um, and uh, so we can start asking ourselves, well, what can we do with a competency map 
from Khan Academy. Well, one thing we can do is construct a kind of GPS system for learning. We can tell students, going back to the last slide again, you know, if you want to get to point X to learn, you know, solving uh, uh, quadratics by factoring, just reading off of the off of the um, the competency map, then I can tell you what skills you need to learn first in order to get there. And if you are not well on a skill, I can tell you, oh, you made a wrong turn here. You need to go back and master this skill before you can get to the place where you want to go. Um, likewise, um, uh, you know, you can, we can provide the same information for teachers. So this is a, a summary screen from Khan Academy um, where uh, I can get a view of my class and see, all right, for one of those competencies, how many students uh, haven't started it yet, how many have started it, how many have shown that they are proficient in it, how many are now need, have not only shown that they're proficient, but we went back a week later to review it and found that they remembered it, and how many of them are struggling with it. And this can really shape the way you, um, uh, you think about your class when you walk in in the morning. If you knew this information, you would know, do I need to go back and review? Can I move on? Uh, does uh, John or Jane need me to pull them aside and ask them to come for office hours? Or are they doing okay? And all of this comes because we've mapped our content to, into these GPS coordinate-like functions that we're calling competencies. You know, there are other possibilities that we're not even beginning to play with yet. Um, for example, um, I could ask the student, all right, so you did well on this competency. Um, would you be interested in learning about X, Y, or Z? Um, or, um, you know, you've now learned how to solve quadratic equations. Would you like to see what kinds of things you can do in the real world with it? I love this site. You know, I've got a tomato in my refrigerator. It is the best tomato in the world. I want to do something with it, but I don't know what. What can I do with a tomato? What can I do with the skill for solving quadratic equations? And this is, this is really I mean, absolutely key for students to, to feel like what they're learning matters in the real world. We can help them do that. We can help them explore that on their own. But we need to create a kind of GPS system for them first so that they can ask the system, the universe, the Google, whatever it is, the Oracle, uh, and and get an answer. And we we in order to do that, we need to think of our content as data. Um, I just want to um, make a note here. Um, I see that there is some there are some audio intermittent audio problems. I apologize for that. I can do about it. Um, but uh, do I I trust that. Uh, Wilma and the good folks at Longsight will let me know if it gets any worse. Uh, so uh, I appreciate your hanging in there with me on that. So uh, moving on to the questions, um, you know, what else could you map to competencies? Think about your course. Um, if you had it broken down to competencies, what else could you map to those competencies? And, and you know, very often um, there are discipline-specific answers. Um, and this is one of the reasons, by the way, why I'm interested in this experiment with flipping the Q&A. I suspect that if you all take a little bit of time to think about your own specific course challenges, that we're going to get a rich and diverse set of answers to these questions. Um, it's not just a pop quiz. So let's, let's talk about another aspect of how uh, Let's think a little bit about mobile. Um, so I don't know about you, but my phone lets me do things that I couldn't do before, like check my email in or in the five minutes uh, between conference calls or you know, when I'm running, literally running from one physical place to another to, between meetings. And 
this ability to time slice, to make use of, of these periods in my day that were formerly useless to me um, is, is incredibly valuable. Um, but when we design our educational content, do we think about that for our students? Do you think about, um, gee, what can I give them that will make their 10 minutes on the campus bus ride more productive for them if they want to be productive in my class during those 10 minutes? Um, or, you know, is there some way that I can deliver content to them someplace other than my classroom where interacting between the content and the place will will help them learn better. I, I love, I don't know about you, but I love those audio tours um, in the museums. And I love them as much because um, I, I always marvel at the ability for it to tell me a fact right at the moment um, when I have something to do with it. As for the specific information that it, that that it's given to me, I mean, I, I you know I took art history courses, um, and I didn't do all that well, uh, but somehow being right there in the moment in front of the painting uh, it really changes the the experience for me of getting that content, makes it more memorable, makes it more impactful. Um, you know, there's a lot of world out there, and we could make it into turn it into our classroom if we simply thought about our content. Um, as changing with the context, the physical context in which our students find themselves. Um, and another aspect is uh, that the content, the, the, their, my phone is always with me, right? So um, if I have a busy schedule, um, I not only can I check to see what meeting is coming up, but I don't have to check. It will poke me and say, hey, don't forget. I know you're having a good conversation, but you've got another call coming up in 10 minutes, so you better wrap this up. Um, that also changes the nature of how we should think about our educational content. Are there reminders that you want to give to students? Is there information that you want to make available to them anywhere? And does that change the learning experience? So again, you know, what I'd like to ask you to consider is how you can design your content around your students' lives rather than the other way around. Um, I had an interesting conversation at a meeting at the uh, American Association of Colleges and Universities recently, and um, we were talking about these sorts of issues and um, about the fact, for example, that um, some colleges have, have um, created a huge increase in student, the number of students who pass remedial math simply by choosing to teach them statistics, which they ha which have applications in their lives that they can see and understand, instead of algebra, which in many cases really doesn't. Um, and somebody at the session said, you know, we keep talking about um, how we need to have more college-ready students, but really what we need is more student-ready colleges. Uh, and that really struck home for me. So uh, what I, I'm asking you to do here is uh, you know, ask yourself um, whether, whether you can make more student-ready content um, as you think about their daily lives and how they do their day. Can you shape your content in a way that makes it easier and more inviting for them to engage in it where and when they find themselves throughout the day. So um, I, I kind of rushed through that a little bit, uh, but uh, you know, Wilma had mentioned to me earlier that we do have some folks um, in Europe um, and who might not be around for the 4.30 call, and because I really am serious about want to use that uh, 4.30 session to get feedback from you, let's take some time uh, to uh, get questions from you. Um, so, uh, so with that, uh, what are your questions? Or I'd take your answers too. 
Okay, I haven't seen any come in. I think maybe. I haven't seen any come in. I think maybe. Um, we're. Oh, here's um, one. We're. Oh, here's one. And actually, I'm gonna mute you. Mute you. Mm -hmm. Looks like we were getting a little bit of feedback there. Okay, so the first question is, um, what advances in LMS do you see facilitating pushing activities or content where they are? I'm muted. So that's a good question. Um, you know, first and foremost, um, uh, the most obvious ones are mobile apps and, and making um, uh, responsive designs for the LMS. Um, so just getting the, getting the content to the devices. And that doesn't solve the whole problem because you still, um, you know, if, if the LMS browser window will shrink down and fit nicely in a phone, you've put a ginormous uh, image that won't display on their phone easily, um, then, or you've put in tables that, kind of, that break the con uh, the, that responsiveness, that's, um, that's something you need to think about. Uh, but, but there are, I think, are um, less obvious answers to that, which I, in some ways are more compelling. Um, just simply the fact that you know your LMS supports iCal standard, so that as uh, you know I, I can plug my phone into a feed from the LMS, and my due dates and class times will automatically appear in my calendar. Um, uh, there's a there's a standard uh, information uh, at the IMS called Caliper, uh, which I think will will also over time be pretty impactful in this regard because um, what it's really doing is if you, you know one of the hard things about um, getting content to a mobile device is the fact that you you really can't anticipate how big the screen is going to be or what the device's capabilities are going to be and so you know the sort of the best way to solve that problem is to put the content in a device agnostic format and let the app on the device decide how to show it. Um, and what Caliper does is it says, okay, I have note information and um, I'm going to format that in a particular way. For those of you who are more technically inclined and may know a little bit about what RSS, the, um, the technical standard that, uh, um, uh, that blogs support, um, what that looks like um, in the code, um, it's a similar idea. It's you know, RSS says, here's your title, um, here's the body, here's the information about the author, here's the information about when it was published, here's the information about where you can find the publication on the web. This is, and the device can say, all right, I, I you know, I know what to do with these things. Some of it, it may just be, okay, I'm going to. I'm going to display um, this information on the screen in a way that's readable. But you can also, even with that, you can do some more sophisticated things. Like if the RSS feed is a you know, feed of, of stuff that's assignments, um, you can say, all right, well, I know who the author is. The author is a student in this class. I can see uh, the, the title or the category for this post. So I know that it goes to an assignment in this class. And I can see the date that it was published, and it's before the due date of this assignment. So I'm going to take this and you know, put this link in the faculty, in the homework Dropbox or in the gradebook and say, you know, this work is done. Um, imagine having a, now we haven't, we haven't even exploited that ability. Our RSS has been around for, um, I don't know, how many years, uh, uh, at least as long as LMSs. Um, and we haven't really exploited that ability in LMSs. But imagine if you could have that feed for just about anything. Student notes, um, you know, a test, uh, uh, you know, information about what students are doing in video in another application. You know, they're off on YouTube or, or they're off on someone's blog. And all that information can feed back to the LMS in ways that, that uh, not only to the LMS point here, their phones, their, their mobile devices, in ways that you know makes sense for those mobile devices. Uh, 
Okay, we have um, actually another question that's kind of a nice uh, segue from what it, some of what you've been talking about. Do you see any software being built now that works um, the way you've described? Um, I'm muted. Hmm. Do I see any software being built now? Well, there are some basic attempts, and there actually have been some basic attempts for a long time. Um, if you look at what um, these CMOOC, you know, weblog like DS-106 uh, by Jim Groom out of University of Mary Washington look like, where they've created an aggregator of weblogs, um, and it's all run by RSS, and again, you know, RSS, there are a million billion mobile devices that can read RSS. Uh, that's one example. Um, there's a um, there is a startup out of California called Empowered U, um, which built a whole mobile layer on top of the open source version of Canvas, which, believe it or not, was acquired by Qualcomm. And if you don't know Qualcomm, they're they're a um, they're the company that makes almost certainly makes the the cell phone chip in your mobile phone because they make the chips for just about every mobile phone on the planet. Um, so that's another case where um, some folks have been thinking hard about how to make content device agnostic and make it appear um, anywhere. You know, the various LMS providers, including Sakai, have been working on mobile enabling their, uh, their software. But, you know, again, part of my argument here today is that start and end by thinking about how the tool mobile um, and you don't think about what you want students to do with their content in big places, not much interesting is going to happen um, because the people who build the tools aren't going to see the needs that you're going to generate by saying, gee, I really want my students to get this content in this way for this purpose. Um, so, um, yeah, progress has been slow, but uh, I think part of that is a failure of imagination on our part. Another question that we got is, uh, do we need to deliver all of the content to a student's device or just a reminder to check the LMS or some other source for content updates? Content update. Unmuted. Yeah, so... This is, this is actually a good illustration of, of my point. Um, do you, you probably have, if you're like me, you've got dozens of apps on your phone. Some of them are, some of them are mobile versions of desktop apps. You know, how much of that functionality do you need to replicate in the app versus in the in the desktop or browser version is going to be different if you're Word or TripAdvisor or uh, any one of the many other apps that you have. It comes down again to the question of what do you want the students to do? If, you're, if your goal is I want to remind the students that there's stuff going on in the LMS and they need to jump in and participate. Um, and the kind of participation that I envision is the kind of participation I've always envisioned, a lot of which is easier to do at a desktop machine with a keyboard and so on and so forth. Then yeah, alerts are, are all you need. But if you want to get the student to go out in the world and do something and interact you know, with your content and the world or the, your, with your content and each other, then there may be pieces of functionality that you need to have with them out in the world in order to make that happen. Um, we have another question. Um, do you have any insight on integrating games into the LMS? I'm muted. Do I have any insight? Um, you know, so I, I guess where I'm going to start is with that word integrating. Um, uh, 
the, the, it used to be that there just wasn't a whole lot of stuff out there worth using educationally. Um, and most of what was out there on the web in terms of functionality could be fairly easily replicated. And so it made a lot of sense to kind of uh, uh, build your own, roll your, your own. Oh, you need a homework Dropbox? No problem. We'll build your homework Dropbox. You need a discussion board? No problem. We'll build, you, we'll, we'll build your discussion board. Then came this sort of world where, okay, now we're starting to get a bunch of apps and some of them are fairly special. What we really want is to stick them into the box that is yes. And uh, uh, so, uh, for example, the uh, I don't know if it still exists anymore, but the the, the Wimba um, um, voice discussion board, which uh, uh, language teachers loved, uh, foreign language teachers uh, just loved, was something that an LMS provider probably wasn't going to build because it was too specialized. Um, but uh, uh, you know. We'd love to have it in there. As we started getting more and more specialized apps for education, it became uh, clear that at least some of them are need all of the screen and don't belong inside the LMS frame. And so um, our integration standards, and I, I see that Chuck Severance is on the call, the, the um, uh, Pied Piper of LTI, um, you know, our standards have evolved to allow these different kinds of integration, but the hard question and the important question isn't so much how you want to integrate games into your LMS, it's how you want to integrate games into your class. A, a game is a great example of content as software, content as functionality. If you're thinking about a game, you're thinking about what do I want my students to do? And um, that's the question you should be asking yourself for all of your content. Um, and so I don't think there's anything special about games uh, except that they um, wake us up uh, to the possibility that content can be more than this dead thing that students have to consume, that it could be a living thing that students interact with to do incredible things. Well, um, speaking of Chuck Severance, he actually has another question here in the queue. Uh, do you see open source as having a role moving toward your vision for education? Yeah, I'm muted. Yeah, um, well, the first question is whether I have a vision for education, and the second question is whether my vision matters. Um, but I would say um, I think um, what is open source? Um, you know, open source is a, a set of methods and cultural conventions to collaborate. And I can't think of anything more essential to education than that. Um, and there are all kinds of, you know, specific questions we can ask about, well, under what circumstances does, you know, it make sense to build an open source LMS or an open source SIS or, you know, what license makes the most sense under which circumstances and so on, but but I don't I don't think there's any question that the core idea, the core set of innovations around collaboration that open source represents, are now and always um, a critical set of tools for educators to work together. And I would add that if you believe as I do that. Um, uh, that educational technology can be a way of sharing best practices, best teaching and learning practices in the form of software code, then having educators very directly involved in the open source development process and enabling them through uh, many means, including but not limited to open licenses, to get in and tinker and build for themselves, uh, educators and students, you know, I, I think that's I think that's critical. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a question. Okay, um, we're running close to the end of our time for the, today's session, but I am going to take one more question um, from one of our colleagues in the UK because I'm assuming um, that they may not be here for the afternoon session. 
And um, <clears throat> for everyone else, if we don't, if we didn't get to your question uh, during this time slot, we'll try to repeat those in the the 4:30 time slot, and that session will be recorded. So if you're not able to join us live, you can always watch the recording at a later date. Um, but the last question for this um, segment here is. Uh, in your view, what is the best way to support our students to connect the dots and build their knowledge to become uh, better consumers of information? Um, I'm muted. So, great question. Um, I, I think that uh, there are long answers, but the, the, the two short answers are, number one, make them content creators. Um, and number two, um, have them out, you know, creating and evaluating content with each other in public about things that actually matter in dialogues that are not academic in the, in the bad sense of the word. Um, you know, we've, there are just all kinds of studies that match the intuition of any good educator or any good, you know, or any observant human being that people are much more interested um, and, and focused on work that they believe actually matters um, than on work that they're given, you know, because it's a hoop they have to jump through in order to prove that they've learned something. Um, and so uh, just getting students out there um, doing work uh, in the wider world on real projects, um, I think that's, that's hugely important. Um, and let me just sort of wrap up um, with a pitch for that for that late, later in the day Q&A session and particularly ask you um, uh, to come prepared. Uh, this is really a, it's a great segue that last. Now I really would like you to be the content creators talking about stuff that really matters. It always struck me as an odd idea to get, you know, we have 167 people in this session, uh, we had 170 a minute ago, and to only let one of them talk, you know, when we have 170 smart people seems like a bad idea to me. So um, I hope that I've given you things to, to think about and that you will uh, come prepared to educate me and your colleagues at the, at the next session. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, this was a terrific keynote. We really appreciate you, you being much, here. And uh, I hope that um, those of you in the audience who didn't get your question answered will be able to join us later in the afternoon. Um, so thanks again. And I'm going to close out now so that we can get started on the 11 o'clock sessions. Um, those will be launching soon. So I hope that you'll make your way to a different webinar room for those sessions. Thanks, everyone. Muted. Thank you. That was terrific.